Okay, hello everyone. This is Michael Hart, and I want to thank you first of all for joining me for this webinar. Uh, today we're going to talk about oral language processing and the CELF-5, which is the Clinical Evaluation of Language Fundamentals 5th Edition. We want to focus on a deeper dive today, predicated on the feedback that I've gotten from you before. This is a slightly different recording than the live webinar that I did on Tuesday. Hopefully it'll be a little bit better and it'll serve as a, a good um, resource for you. Now I always like to start with our roadmap. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're going to do today. First I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes talking about brain research uh, my, my favorite little quote from the Old Testament is, from whence all things spring. I think that we've gotten far enough down the road in the last couple of decades with brain research to really help us to begin to be uh, much more specific and much more clear about being able to talk about how kids' brains are wired or how our brains are wired and how that impacts our acquisition of reading, spelling, and written language skills obviously focused here today on dyslexia. Now, we're also going to talk just for a minute about what components of language processing are usually tested and why, but we're going to do that within the context of a brief overview of cognitive processing in general. Because when we do a complete evaluation, there are many, many different components in addition to language processing that we need to understand to fully appreciate how this particular person's, again, brain is wired and what we should expect in terms of their performance and, most importantly, what we need to do to build a plan or a map that's going to allow us to take care of that child or that student. So we're going to go from there. We're going to actually talk specifically about what the self 5 measures because it's just one component of language processing. I mean, there's several components, quite frankly, uh, but it's a one key component, and um, we're going to talk about that and how we interpret the scores. So we'll have some examples for you. I'm going to use some real scores to show you how we drill down to the point where we can actually create or capture the language that we need so that it's much easier for a couple things. One for us to have a common language to speak between the parents, the specialist, and the school with regard to what we're actually going to do in the classroom. How are we actually going to build a map that's going to help us uh, support this child's efforts to, to uh, uh, deal with their weaknesses. Um, so it's going to be really uh, focused on communication, collaboration, and specificity, okay? That is, I think, absolutely key. And the, and the beauty of the self 5 I think, is that it now is structured in a way that allows us to do that if we know where to look and how to do that. So um, we're going to cover a lot of ground today. Let me explain. Actually, I'll stop here. Let me explain how this webinar is structured for you. I'm going to talk with you for about 45 minutes, and I'm going to cover quite a few topics in the slides. And I'm doing it in a way to allow you that this is not just a one-off. You're not going to just listen to this and then kind of get uh, left uh, to your own devices. We're going to make sure that you have a copy of the slides. We're going to, you're going to notice very quickly that I've got uh, links to additional resources, not only embedded in some of these specific slides, but also listed at the end of this set of slides so that you can use them as reference points to drill down as deeply as you feel that you need to. So in many ways, I'm trying to cover the, the waterfront for parents who really want to do a deep dive because the more effective they are in understanding the tests and, and the results and how to interpret them, the more effective they are as advocates. For specialists, there's a lot of specialists who um, may just start be using self-five in the beginning or maybe they just want to learn a little bit more. 
And then, of course, it's always best for the educators to be able to, to have some exposure so they understand when they see a report and they see that somebody's given a cell phone, they can much more quickly and efficiently take a look at what the scores are and begin to understand whether the information they need to act is actually there. Okay, so now let me talk about brain research for a minute. I think, like I said, in the last couple of decades, uh, we've been quite we've been quite successful with regard to specific mapping. Uh, in fact, both in terms of structures of the brain, which is the gray matter, as well as the what they call white fiber, which is the fibrous connection of neurons that network between the different parts of the brain. So the beauty in that for me is this. Uh, we're able to speak very much more comfortably and more directly with using this concept of how a person's brain is wired. But it, I, I also think that it affords us the opportunity to, uh, to become more descriptive um, in our uh, discussions about how a child's brain is wired because I'd like to see us get further and further away from the idea of the disease model, and I'd like to depathologize the language that's used to explain how our dyslexic kids' brains are wired so that um, it doesn't become something that's wrong. It's just more along the lines of a developmental variation. So clearly, certainly, in the, and nowhere near in the near future, are we going to start doing functional MRIs with kids to help diagnose dyslexia. I mean, it's obviously still in the lab, it's still very expensive, but I think the information coming out of that is is really, really super important. Now, when I when you see on the slide here is when we talk about our narrative, what I mean there is that because we can now use descriptive language, we can use that to build out when we, you know, we talk about what should be involved in an evaluation, one of the key components is talking about who that child is as a person. And so this piece of understanding how the brain is wired is a component to our discussion, our write-ups and reports, uh, you know, the communication that we have with regard to not just how their brain is wired in terms of dyslexia, but we're talking about who they are as a person. And I just feel that's super, super important. You know, what are their dreams? What are their passions? Uh, you know, what, uh, where do they really, really shine in their lives? Because uh, we know that this is a chronic situation, and, you know, for them, many of the kids, reading, writing, and spelling will continue to be a difficult issue for them chronically. It's not acute, it's chronic. So we have to make sure that when we think about our kids, we think about their entire brain and their entire sense of who they are as people. So that's why I, I like to talk about that in terms of uh, the foundation for our particular map. Now, as I mentioned, um, I wanted to stop for just a minute and remind everyone that this particular webinar is specifically focused on one component or several different components of oral language but we're not specifically discussing phonological awareness and rapid automatic naming in this uh, webinar. We're going to talk about that in the next webinar that I have. But I want to also remind people that when we think about a child, these days the research is quite clear that in terms of their acquisition of literacy skills, we have to at some point get clear about uh, the child's more broader based skills, including executive functioning. And obviously we've talked a lot about working memory and processing speed and how those interact with each other, uh, their overall intellectual capability, their reasoning abilities, and even visual processing. And I know that you know historically there's been this huge issue with whether dyslexia is a language processing issue or a visual processing issue. I think it's pretty clear now that the research is strongly uh, focused on language processing. processing how the, uh, however, we still need to understand the visual processing components for a child, specifically with regard to 
uh, orthographic or rather, you know, their ability to accurately and speedily uh, identify letters, syllables, words, and so forth. So we are in the future. In just a couple of weeks, we're going to have another webinar that's going to focus on phonemic awareness and rapid automatic naming. Uh, and I'm going to specifically do that by talking about the comprehensive test of phonological processing, the CTOP. And then I'm going to also talk about testing for rapid automatic naming. Today, though, we're going to focus on all the various components of oral language. And that is what the cell 5 does. Now, the cell 5 uh, is a very... <laughs> I'd say is very ambitious. The developers really wanted to cover a lot of waterfront with the cell five, which, which is fantastic. However, um, it's also kind of a uh, reminder for us that we have to be careful that that one single test certainly is not the be all and end all of testing for oral language. In fact. There are several other highly regarded tests that are used in this area of testing. And at the end of my resources, at the end of this um, series of slides, you're going to find uh, several different lists of tests that are highly regarded by people in the field that cover different aspects of what we're trying to assess when we do a complete evaluation for our kids. Nonetheless, I think the cell 5 is an excellent test, and uh, I think it's, it's been used quite often these days, so it's really important that we uh, make sure that we know it well, and our understanding is, is something that we have as kind of a tool in our, in our quiver, our tool set. So let's, let's talk about some basics. Uh, and again, I want to kind of uh, reiterate what I said in the beginning, which is that um, what I'm trying to do in this webinar is this is a very, very complex test. And to assume that I can drill down into the deepest levels in 45 to 50 minutes is not appropriate. Uh, I think what's more appropriate is to give you an anchor, give you a, a series of slides that are really going to break it out for you that can always be, always be serve as a reference for you. And then you combine that with the resources at the end. In fact, here's a, on this page, you'll see that under test structure, the test objectives and description bullet is actually a link to a very lengthy document, 35-page document that Pearson, who developed the Cell 5, has published so that people can get very, very detailed uh, understandings of the objectives and descriptions of each subtest. Now, um, to go back, so there will be the resources at the end of these slides, resources embedded in here, plus the opportunity to ask me questions. Uh, I'm not going to go away. You all know how to get a hold of me. In fact, my email is, is uh, going to be on the last slide. And I urge you to contact me anytime you have questions. So I want to make sure that you feel like this is an ongoing relationship and that um, you don't have to struggle trying to figure something out on your own. If there's a support system in place for you, and I'd be more than happy to be a part of that. Now, one of the beautiful things about the Cell 5, and they call it, the Pearson guys call it, a comprehensive, flexible assessment. I think that's very meaningful. And obviously, we talked about it being very comprehensive. It wants to cover a lot of different bases of oral language. But the beauty of this particular version is that each of the, there's 16 main subtests. Each of them can be considered a standalone assessment. So that what that means is that the more you know about the child and the more you're comfortable with the cell 5, if there's two or three subtests that you want to give to the child to really bear down into the areas you think are the either areas of weakness or perhaps you want to focus on what their strengths are, you're able to do that and you're not locked into having to give a huge battery before you can. Uh, you know, convert those to scores. So I think that that's uh, 
a really powerful component to this thing because I know that doing a full-blown psychoeducational evaluation can be very, very time-consuming and very, very expensive. So it really behooves us to know this test well so that we can pick and choose what we think we need for the child. Very large age range, as you can see, that, that corresponds to five years, zero months. So again, let me just say that there are people, some of you who are listening are going to be uh, beginners, and so I'm going to make sure that um, there's not any jargon here that you miss or something that doesn't make any sense to you. And I'll just ask the more sophisticated people to uh, bear with me as I do that really quickly. So age range, five years, zero months, through 21 years, 11 months. So we can really, uh, this is a very, very viable test for a very large group of people. Now, again, because you can do standalone assessments, there's a core language score that you can uh, derive by doing a number of subtests, which you'll see in a minute, but um, that, that can only take, you know, maybe 30 minutes. The total assessment, as I said, could be very, very lengthy. It could be two, three hours, depending on what you decide to do. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about this idea of the core language score versus paying attention to the subtests, because... As many of you know by now, the core language score is derived from statistically combining a bunch of scores from subtests. So if there is a great deal of variability among those subtests, then the core language score or any other composite score, quite frankly, is rendered meaningless because it doesn't give us the specific information that we need to be able to draw that direct line between what we're seeing in the testing and what needs to happen in the classroom. Now, norm reference, criterion reference uh, scores, I think most people on this call understand that. Norm reference refers to uh, a child being compared to a very large norm group, very close to their same age. Criterion reference tests really refer more to uh, mastery tests where it's an individual, you're measuring individual progress within one particular person that the testing's been done. So I don't think you need me, if you need me to, to go deeper into that, please just send me an email. Now, next couple of slides, there's a ton of information here. I don't think uh, it's the best use of our time for me to go through each and every subtest and each and every composite, but I wanted to have this available to you as a quick reference so that when you print out these slides, uh, anytime you encounter something with a cell phone, you can take a quick look here and it will be available to you and uh, you, it'll quickly organize your thinking. So, as I mentioned a minute ago, the core language score is derived from those four subtests that you see here, word classes, formulated sentences, recalling sentences, semantic relationships. The first link that I showed you two slides ago will provide you with very detailed descriptions of what each one of these subtests are and what they measure and how they're given. Uh, the point again I want to remake I want to make is that we've got the this kind of overall score, we've got receptive languages, which is a measurement of language that we understand. A good example of that would be if a child has issues with uh, following directions um, and listening to directions. You, in the classroom, certainly don't want to have them at the back of the room in a really loud, in a really loud and, and kind of chaotic classroom situation, and then have the the teacher or the aide provide you know three or four step directions to the kids. I mean, that's just not something that's going to be uh, uh, useful for that child, and if they don't have uh, the ability to follow directions like that, then we have to make accommodations for that. So receptive language, expressive language is, of course, language that we use to express ourselves, and it's all about whether we're able to do that at a level that we would expect predicated on our overall capabilities and our age. So you see there's Core language, receptive language, expressive language, language memory, language content, uh, the interpretation uh, scores. I'm going to go into this in greater detail in a couple of minutes, but 
They use what's called standard scores, percentile ranks, and I wanted to point out this growth scale values. Uh, and I did a lot of work. I looked all over the place, and I couldn't see a lot of people using this yet. But the concept here is that if you give the child the self or some of the subtests of the self at one point in time, and then you know a year or a year and a half later you give it again, you're going to be able to derive these growth scale values, which is going to give you a sense for how well the child's actually progressed in those particular areas over time. So that is uh, something I don't believe was in self four, um, but I think with time, if we start to use that, then there may be some real value because I know a lot of parents want to know, you know, what are we really seeing in terms of growth? Now the next link I have here for you is just a very nice clean uh, table, conversion table that shows you um, standard scores and percentile ranks from the very, very superior range all the way down to very low average. So that's really kind of a just a simple thing that I wanted to give you that if you print that out, it's very useful to have when you're doing a quick look at some test scores. A couple of comments on scoring options. Uh, there is a web-based scoring model, like many, many tests these days, there is a web-based scoring and reporting uh, module uh, available to you. Some feedback on the blog in the blogosphere was that um, people didn't like it. You had to pay an extra dollar to get the report of the scoring for in each individual child, or you can pay, I think it's $35,000, or excuse me, 35000 $35 a year for, you know, an unlimited number. And there was some uh, uh, complaint about that because, um, the cost for some people, if you don't have a school covering that, may be difficult for you. But also, because it is cloud-based, uh, sometimes the um, servers were down. And if you're in the middle of scoring and reporting, then you know it's not available to you. But I, I'm quite sure that, that will be cleaned up over time. The, the caveat here is that, remember, we want to make sure that we have a complete narrative about who this person is. Um, holistically, fully. So we have to be careful not to fall back on just using the scoring and then some kind of boilerplate for the reporting. And that's a, a heads up for the parents. Um, a lot of times you'll, you, your head will just, your eyes will cross and your head will get, uh, you know, explode because, you know, you're just reading all this boilerplate that really is not very useful or it doesn't really bring it alive. It doesn't really bring who your child is really in an accurate way. So um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a, a fan of the web-based scoring, and I, I uh, think that it's certainly going to be what everybody's going to be doing very shortly if, not there, if they aren't already. So all things to all people. That's the, the self with regard to oral language. That means, you know, they're, they're going to be, it's very broad-based. So the better you know this test, the better you can realize where you may want to focus. But they want to they want to provide you with all kinds of information, as you can see here. Performance in the classroom, performance in other contexts, you know, a, helping you provide a piece for the oral language with regard to strengths and weaknesses. And, of course, the eligibility for services is a huge issue, I know. One of the things I ask people to do is remember that I know that that's super important and that uh, you wait a long time to find out whether the scores support your efforts to get your child special services, and I completely respect that. And at the same time, we want to make sure that we don't get too over-organized around just the scores and remember to be narrative and descriptive with regard to who this child is. Now, if there's the one thing I want you to remember about today, it's that the cell five will generate item analyses that you can computer generate them so it doesn't take you a million years to do it manually. Item analyses that you can grab specifically where the child is struggling and create goals 
out of that for remediation. Now, whether that's in a formal IEP or 504, or whether it's just, you know, good teaching, the point is that um, the beauty of this, and probably the thing I, mo I most love about the Cell 5, is that there is this capability for out of analysis, because that's really where the rubber meets the road, and we're going to talk about that too. Now, quick comment. I get a lot of questions from parents and from specialists uh, with regard to who's capable, who's qualified to, to give a test, test like the C5. So what I've done here is I've provided you with a link. It's here and at the end of the slide. So it's going to allow you to uh, pull up the, uh, I think they're IDEA, uh, I think. They're written by a governing body that very clearly identifies who gets to, who is allowed to do the cell five enhancement. Now, historically, testing oral language has been the purview of uh, speech and language specialists. And the end result of that, quite frankly, from my experience, 25, 30 years of experience, is that when we're trained as psychologists, we're not necessarily trained about the importance of oral language and phonological awareness and rapid automatic naming with regard to testing for dyslexia. So for many, many decades, you saw people in my role as a psychologist completely miss this piece, even though we now know from the research that it is the most critical piece. So we have to do one of two things. We have to either, and psychologists and other certain mental health professionals at a certain level with a certain degree of training specifically in the self five are also eligible to give this test. So to drill down into the details, go ahead and take a look at this page. Just know that we have to do one of two things. We either have to make sure that we're aware of how important it is and we make, as psychologists, we make that part of our uh, tool chest or we have the wherewithal to understand that we've got to collaborate with a speech and language person so that the proper things get tested the first time. So it really behooves us as parents to understand the importance of making sure we get oral language and phonological processing and rapid automatic naming testing done, as well as the specialist recognizes that and it's a really huge gift to the teachers because the teachers oftentimes aren't supported in their efforts either at the university level or in professional development with regard to getting the information they need to make in proper informed judgments about how to take care of these kids. Now, I'm going to go to this quickly, and this is maybe for the less sophisticated people, but um, there are, in the cell 5, there are scale, two types of scaled scores. Um, and by that I mean, you take, I want to show you in a minute, in a, in a bigger table, but you take the raw score from a child, and it is statistically converted. I use my favorite technical term, which is smushed. And that raw score is converted to what they call a standard score. And that standard score allows you to compare your child to the norm group, to this large group of kids that are almost exactly the same age as your child. So you have a sense for where they're at. Now, for subtests, the vast majority of psychological tests and educational tests use a scale score where 10 is the average score. So you see here, average means mean, you know, mean, average, same thing. And that means that if you, the percentile rank-wise, if you line up 100 kids against the wall, your child or that child will do as well or better than 50 of those kids. So that's what I want you to keep from here. I mean, you, I, I don't think there's anybody listening that hasn't seen this uh, a lot, but I wanted to just kind of make sure that I had it in here for you. And also, it's helpful to have this guide of using uh, ranges. So... Statistically, the classification of average actually refers to scaled scores between 8 and 12. So anything above that is above average, and quite frankly, there's superior and very superior, and then 7 and below is below average and then low average. Now, the 
table that I gave you a few slides back will uh, be much more detailed, and it'll take you through every single um, number, but it's really based on a um, more what they do with composite scores, where the index scores or the composite scores that are derived from a grouping of subtests that are measuring different aspects of the same thing. Usually, uh, most psychological and educational tests, they use 100 as the average score when it's converted to a standard score. So at the subtest level, the raw score is converted to a standard score. At the at the composite level, the various subtests that are clustered together under that general category are statistically converted, and that ultimate score is called a composite score or an index score, and they use a mean or average of 100. On a percentile basis, same thing, right? You line up 100 kids against the wall, and that particular child, if they received a 100, has done as well as or better than 50 of the kids. So that was something I, I think if you are new to this, uh, I think that's important to know. And if you are more sophisticated and you already know this, uh, at least you have this uh, table here that you can really quickly refer to if need be. Uh, now, Getting back to that concept of does my child or student qualify for special services, um, I have to make general comments about this because all, sometimes all the way down to the district or the state level, there are different de definitions used for what the clinical cutoff is for severity of a language disorder that will trigger the right to have special services in the classroom. Now, I quite frankly, uh, well, I, I understand it has to happen, so I'm going to leave it at that. But what I've done here is the uh, de determining the severity of a language issue is a link that is going to take you to a discussion that uh, Pearson created so that you have a very um, thorough explanation of uh, how these guidelines were formed, quite frankly. And again, you'll notice here, um, when you think about core language score and the index scores, they're going to be using a mean or an average of 100, um, but there's going to be, I'm not going to get into standard deviations, but there's going to be a, a range here from 86 to 114. Above that will be above average. Uh, below that will be below average. So that's going to be some stuff that you can see that you'll you'll be able to derive uh, meaning from that predicated on what exactly your district needs. Now another point to be made here is that I uh, just I probably should include this article. Write to me if you'd like it. Uh, a wonderful article that explains that if you're a very young child and you haven't been exposed to the reading process yet, you may very well have language issues. And those language issues, which are chronic, are going to manifest as reading issues when you are of the age where reading is introduced into your academic program. And so it's a beautiful explanation that these are not two separate things. They actually flow together because it's all based on how your brain is wired and how um, certain developmental variations result in uh, difficulties with reading, writing, and spelling, particularly in the oral language area as well as phonological awareness and um, rapid automatic naming. So let's do, let's take a look at this for a minute because this is really an actual example of an evaluate a, a table for evaluation results for a child who is 10 years and 7 months old. And for those of you who are somewhat new, I want to kind of ask you to focus on three different columns. Um, the rest of it is it's not difficult to understand, but it's like, well, I don't know if we want to do that today. So you'll see on the left column, those are names of the specific subtests. 
and several different scores are derived from that, so to speak. So that you have the actual raw score, and then the scaled score, remember, is derived statistically from the raw score. You don't have to know how that happens. There's a table in the back of the book, and, it just, and it's all done for you. There is a percentile rank associated with that scaled score. And then I wanted to just point out the um, growth scale value here, the GSV, because that will automatically be generated by the software program for you. So if you do a pre and post test, you'll be able to use this to assess progress for a particular child. Now, when we get into the when we get into interpretation, let's take a quick look here. You're going to see this very very quickly. Remember, scaled scores at the subtest level, the average is 10. So look at the intensity of the variation amongst all these different subtest scores and this child's performance. We're going to look at a couple of them. We're going to look at one that is a real strong, a really significant weakness, word classes, and we're going to look at one that's a strength in that sentence assembly. So you can see how we have to be careful not to over-organize around the core language score or some of the index scores. When you see this kind of variability, you know that there are very specific cognitive issues that need to be very explicitly addressed. And the way to do that is to go beyond this level and get down into the actual uh, item analysis. And that's what's going to allow you to create a common language between the parents, the specialist, and the teacher, as well as a opportunity for collaboration in terms of mapping what remediation has to happen and whether that's in the home, whether that's with the teacher in the school, whether that's with a tutor, uh, whatever environment that happens in, we need to make sure that we're addressing this variability. And you'll see that it's very interesting. He has uh, one score at the top end of the average range, one score at the above average range, and then uh, this is at the low end of the average range. But essentially, there are several different subtest scores measuring different aspects of oral language that are really quite problematic. Now, word classes, to get a sense for that, remember 10 is the average. This is a percentile ranking of 0.1. A very, very, I mean, it's like, what happened? I mean, was this poor little guy, you know, we really needed, and this is where the narrative kicks in, was this poor little guy distracted or was this truly an accurate representation of their, their abilities. And, and I'll talk about word classes in a minute. And a sentence, a sentence assembly, quite strong, you know, top 15%. So same brain, but very, very different skill sets. So what happens historically has been that we do the test, we crank out the, the tables of scores and the boilerplate, and Sometimes, if we're lucky, the specialist will provide some really good detail with regard to recommendations. A lot of times, we kind of fall short on that. And I think that that is a source of tr tremendous frustration for both the parents and the teachers because, you know, you get so excited that you're finally getting the child or the student evaluated and it's a very lengthy process, very expensive if it's privately done. It's expensive for the school districts, too. And then you wait and you wait and wait and get your hands on it, and all of a sudden you realize, uh, well, we didn't do the right test to get the full picture, or we did some of the right tests, but they stopped short of being able to help you do, as I mentioned, create that language that is going to drive collaboration and drive specific, clear understanding of what has to happen in the classroom. So are we done? Nope. We're halfway. So let's take a look at word classes. Okay, let's break, the, let's break this down. Uh, this link at, at the top of the page is, uh, again, the same link I think I showed you earlier that's got 
about 35 pages of descriptions about the subtest. Word classes is actually on the 12th page. So if you wanted to, to scroll to that after we do this uh, webinar, then I hope you find it a little bit easier. Word classes actually falls under several different categories, but um, I want to think about it in terms of receptive language. Because what this is, this test is given uh, orally or visually, depending on your age. So you give them three or four orally presented words or visually presented pictures, and the student selects the two words that are most related. So word, think word classification. You know, and how well is this person's uh, a, how well is this person able to measure the ability to understand relationships between associated words? Okay, this is a receptive language task. How well are they able to listen or visually track and and try to find the two that are most related? And I think the visual is for the younger kids who, um, you know, you give them something to anchor to visually so it's easier for them. This is a subtest that can be given all the way through. You know, forgive me, that's a bit of a, it's 5 to 2111. So that's what word, cla word classes think, word classification. Now, remember that now we can get to the real point here. Remember this child is 10 years, 7 months old. And, remember, and also you'll learn that this particular subtest actually has sub-areas, and they're all very well explained, so you know exactly what each one of these is. I don't think I want, I don't think you want me to go through each one of these necessarily every time, so I'm going to use semantic class because you can see this is the category of sub-area within this sub-test. You have correct items, you got incorrect items. Look at this flow. One, two, three, four, six, eight, nine, ten. See, there's a little bit of stumbling here, and then they top out. And once they miss a certain number of items, then the, the subtest is stopped. Now, remember, this child got a skill score of one. So this is not anywhere near representative of what you would expect for a child who was uh, 10 years, 7 months old. But you know that semantic classification or meaning classification is a real challenge for this person even though their sentence assembly is really quite strong. So one of the things that you can know immediately is that there are many many tools available now especially digital apps that can be used to help this child understand relationships between words better. So in this case you could say, you know, what's a, how are a bear and a whale alike? Well, they're both mammals. Now, a fish is not a mammal. A fish is an animal, so is a mammal. A fish lives in water, and a whale lives in water. So in other words, you're, you're, there's all kinds of tools. The one that I like to recommend is a tool called MindMeister, M-E-I-S-T-E-R. And it's a, I mean, at the lowest level, it's free. It's an app that you can use, and you can use it at home. You can use it with a tutor. You can integrate it into your classroom, quite frankly, in kind of a blended, blended learning scenario where if you see this kind of weakness in classification for a child, then this has to be a part of the recommendations, okay, because this is going to help them specifically address that. So that's an example. Now, you're going to see in a, in a vowel there's a very large amount of scores, and a lot of them have to be, um, you know, parsed out and, and described as specifically as possible so that a whole lot of recommendations that can, can be made. But the idea is you can go through every subtest of the cell 5 and get down to the item analysis so that with regard to oral language, you've got a map that you can use to put your heads together with the specialist, put your heads together with the teacher and say, okay, this is what we know about how their brain is wired. This is what's in my tool set. This is what I think I can do in the classroom. This is what I think we can do at home. This is what I think what we can do with a tutor. 
and collaborate with each other to make sure that that specific area is being addressed. I hope that I think that makes sense. Now I wanted to kind of like change it up a little bit because I wanted to uh, talk about a strength. Remember with dyslexic kids, six or seven hours a day, five days a week, nine months out of the year, they're in an environment where there is oftentimes constant messaging that there is something wrong with them, that they aren't getting it, uh, and the worst case is they think they're stupid or they are somehow broken. So when we think about giving a psychoeducational evaluation, we don't want to just focus on what their weaknesses are. We want to focus on their whole profile, including their strengths. So when you see an above average ability in a percentile like an 84th percentile with a child who's obviously really struggling in other areas, you want to figure out, okay, what can we do to provide the child with opportunities to show their strengths in the classroom, show their strengths during special projects or um, maybe after school with the teacher or whatever. So, you know, sentence assembly, it, it really it measures how kids construct sentences, oddly enough, huh? And it's all about measuring the complexity of how well that child understands the subtleties and nuances of definitions and whether that matches up with their age range and what you would expect. Because we have a norm group that's going to tell us that, um, you know, this is what we should expect for a child that age. Now, clearly this child has a real facility for that, so we want to support that in the schools and at home and with the tutor so that there's a sense for let's find a bright spot where this child can shine in this environment where Frankly, they're going to struggle, and we know they're going to struggle, but we're going to make sure that it's balanced and take some of the pressure off. I hope, uh, yeah, that uh, makes sense, I think. So this is the item analysis for the sentence assembly subtest, and you, again, I want to just show you this quickly. So sentence assembly subtest, these are the sub areas, active, declarative, interrogative, passive. These are the sub-sub areas that are specifically assessed by the particular test items. So you can take a look at this and you go back and you say, okay, what was item one? It had to do with a subordinate clause. Okay, they, they did well with that. Uh, what about this? I mean, you can just begin to get down to the granular level at the item analysis level, which is going to allow you to, again, I'm going to sound like a broken record, you know, create the common language you can use to build the map. Now, there are two more things that I wanted to mention to you before we wrap up. One is that the Cell 5 also provides an observation rating scale. And I'm sure those of you, certainly the specialists and the teachers and, and, the, and the parents who are sophisticated, Appreciate that there are many, many different observation rating scales out there. Some of them are general. Some of them are specific to attentional difficulties. Uh, some of them are some whatever. But this particular test provides an observation rating scale specifically with regard to a parent, teacher, and other adult perceptions of how the child is doing in oral language. So you may or may not choose to use this, but the beauty of it is, I think, is that it creates a language and a structure you can use in a narrative. So that in addition to talking about who this child is a whole, you could say, by the way, you know, we also observed this. And the teacher observes this in the classroom. The specialists observed that while they were working with the child or the tutor. Or the parents observe it. And you can take a look at the differences in perception between the groups and try to come to some sense or understanding of of um, uh, which may very well help you drive which subtests to give, okay, or what other tests outside of the cell five to give, because maybe you're seeing stuff that relates to working memory or processing speed or something like that. So I wanted to mention that this is available to you, and there is um, 
uh, lengthy discussion about it in the resources that I've given. Finally, um, Cell 5 also has created a screening edition that is available for the whole age range. It's basically just a, a subset of the, of the diagnostic test items. I would urge you not to use this as a replacement, um, but it might be something that you could use as a quick and dirty to give you a sense of uh, where you might want to go in the direction of uh, providing uh, an evaluation for a certain set of subtests. Okay, so that was just something I wanted to point out to you. Um, and again, there's resources that are covered. So on this page, we've got three things that are specific to the self. There's the assessment process, there's test objectives and descriptions, and then there's uh, the article about determining severity of language disorder. Then what I did was I provided you with a page of links that were um, mostly uh, links of many, many other tests, not just in the or area of oral language or photological awareness, but more so let me get a sense for what kinds of tests are commonly used to measure this particular area. And I found this to be super helpful. And um, you can see the third one, University of Michigan, kind of provides a review by the staff at the University of Michigan that works for the reading group. And uh, I found it to be very useful in terms of my thinking, in terms of you know, what should I really be providing here. So again, I want to let you know that you'll have access to these slides, um, giving you links to all these resources. And I promise not to leave you hanging. If you have questions, you can contact me um, at the email that you see below, drmichaelhart at gmail.com. Please don't hesitate to ping me anytime. And I'm pretty good at get, about getting back to you within a day or so. And then uh, I've got another upcoming webinar on April 30th, and that's going to have to do with phonological awareness and rapid automatic naming specifically with regard to the comprehensive test of phonological processing and the um, Martha Denkla Marianne Wolf rapid automatic naming tests. So I uh, hope you can join me for that. Uh, also, I'm going to be sending a, a survey out. Uh, once I get a chance to get the recording out, which will be done in about a day or two, today is the 16th. Um, I'm going to give you a few days to be able to take a look at that, and then I'm going to send a survey. I very much welcome unvarnished opinions about what was valuable to you and what was helpful to you. And if I went too far, too deep, I need to know. If I didn't go too deep enough, far enough, I need to know. So I will, I will send that to you as well. Hopefully that uh, is something that you'll – and I make sure that there are like three or four sentences. It takes you one minute to fill it out. So. Uh, I really appreciate any kind of feedback you can be there. And so thank you very much. i very grateful to have the opportunity to work with you. And I hope it's the beginning of a long relationship. So best of luck and have a wonderful day.